Hey everyone, I assume we're live. It says we are. So anyway, um, I'm going to do my post-NAB show report. Uh, I spent two days there this week, Monday, Tuesday. Um, honestly, I went there mostly for to find content for this channel, but it's also always uh, good to see brand new products. Um, just So start with a couple of just random thoughts, um, some observations about NAB itself. Uh, I've been going for... Well, my first year was 2006, and, and I've missed a couple of years, but I've been most years. And this was easily the smallest of the shows that I've been to. Uh, fewer vendors, um, smaller booths from some f some vendors. Uh, you can tell that uh, the show isn't quite as widely as attended as it hasn't been in the past. In the past, they've always said over 100,000 attendees. This year, they said nearly 100,000 attendees. So things are definitely slowing down a little bit. Uh, uh, I don't know exactly the reasons for that. Probably a lot of it has to do with the internet. Probably a lot of it's just the cost. It's extremely expensive to, for a vendor to, to show up to NAB. Um, but I, I think a lot of people who have decided not to go may not necessarily understand the reason, um, the reasons to go. I, you know, if you haven't been before, the initial impression you have is that the reason you want to go is to see the new products and if that's if that's the reason you intend to go then you probably don't need to go because you can get all the information about the products online all, you know, all these companies have websites they publish information about the products uh, online so you can get that information there but in the first few years I went that was actually how what I was thinking about it too but as I've attended more and more I've realized that the real reasons for attending there first of all for tr for training sessions they've got a lot of the vendors have great training sessions for a lot of the products you know particularly like companies like Adobe uh, Blackmagic they do training um, basically non-stop the whole time they're there um, yeah with those ring lights yes um, so yeah there's a lot there's a lot of training that goes on that's great uh, my main reason for going is for interacting with the people who actually create the products you know when you call into tech support or you email into tech support with a company, you tend to get people who weren't involved with the creation of products at all. But most of these companies do bring the engineers and other people who are really familiar with the products to the show. And you can interact with those people and talk to them. And I get questions, I get answers to questions that you probably wouldn't be able to get otherwise, even uh, especially working through the normal like channels that are available through the internet and telephone and whatnot. So. Um, it, it's as I've attended more and more, it's becoming more and more obvious that the main reason to attend is for interaction with other people. Um, we've got got a few comments coming in here, so um, just to cut over here. So, so Tinder saying the same thing. Thought it was smaller. It was definitely a smaller show. Um, Whitney talking about some ring lights. If you watched, if you've seen the videos on our channel, because uh, Whitney went with us. Um, we did a video together, and then Never Ends Productions. Doug, there, is watching from his trailer. Cool. So um, the other thing, definitely, yeah, there's definitely, definitely fewer vendors in attendance. They had questions. I say they had uh, tables and chairs set up in places for people to sit around and eat or talk or whatever. Places that have always been booths in the past. So it definitely, definitely fewer vendors in attendance there. So. And so Tinder is basically echoing the same thing I was saying. Like being able to interact with the engineers is, is awesome. So I've been able to establish some pretty good relationships. My primary reason for attending this year was to basically establish new relationships with with vendors, so that I can bring more channel, more more equipment into review here on the channel. Uh, it's I mean it's always great to talk to people to see the new products, but my main reason was to find 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 content for this channel. So and I've been able to do that. I was I was able to talk to a whole bunch of different vendors, and I'm probably going to have quite a few products coming in for review. A lot of the smaller companies, especially, are are very friendly about that, and I may even have some success with some bigger companies as well. I reached out to a lot of different people. So, uh, let's see. Now, um, I wanted to get into some of the products that I that I looked at and go into a little more detail. Um, I did release a number of videos on this channel yesterday, things that I saw there on the show floor, but those were basically just high-level overview, and it wasn't until I got, time, got home and, and had some time yesterday to kind of review more information to really form opinions on a lot of the stuff that was there. So, obviously, Blackmagic is a big... Uh, it's used by a lot of people who watch the channel, and they had quite a few announcements. Probably the one that I thought was most exciting 
was the new switcher, their new 8K switcher. It's called ATEM Constellation 8K. Uh, the fact that it's 8K is cool, but really this thing is an amazing 4K or Ultra HD switcher. This thing has 40 inputs, uh, 24 outputs, and all those outputs are totally reconfigurable, so you can send any signal you want on those. Uh, it, if you just look at it as an 8K switcher, it's actually not that impressive. It's because you, what you have to do is you have to combine four groups of four inputs or groups of four outputs in order to do 8K, because uh, there's no such thing as an SDI signal that can carry an 8K signal yet. And so you have, you have to use four 12 gig uh, connections in order to get 8K. And so when you do that, you go from 40 inputs down to 10 inputs, and you go from 24 outputs down to six outputs. And at that point, you can really look at this thing as more or less an 8K version of their Television Studio HD product, which is a nice switcher, uh, but it, I, I don't think that 8K is the reason to buy this thing. I think that having all the other capabilities uh, that it brings is, are the main reasons to uh, to get this product versus some of their other ones that they offer. So, I mean, obviously they have other 4K switchers, uh, but this one offers some very unique things. Uh, 40 inputs, we don't have that on any other switcher. We don't have 24 outputs on any other switcher. Uh, we, it, it comes with 16 keyers. We have had that before on the broadcast studio. Uh, it has four MEs, we have had that before. Uh, it has two super sources, which is new, and they've never offered that in any other products before. Uh, it has a 156 channel audio mixer uh, with pretty advanced processing on every channel. That's, that's, that's a new feature as well. Um, just a lot of a lot of little upgrades throughout. So uh, when Blackmagic announced this, they also put up a, a technical video and about this and other products that they, they put out. And th that video is two and a half hours long. So I'll save you some time and summarize a lot of that for you. But suffice it to say, what they really did here is they decided anything that anybody might want in a switcher at a affordable price, they threw it in there. So that's really what they're trying to target. Uh, looks like a nice product um, with that many inputs and outputs. It's once one uh, someone could actually probably get a, away with uh, not having a routing switcher in front of it. So a lot of cool things there. Um, let's see. Let's see what else is worth mentioning here. Um, the fact that it has scalers on every input that's absolutely awesome. So you can mix and match your inf inf input sources. You have standard def on one input, ultra high, ultra high def on another input, uh, 720p on another input, and it automatically does a scale to whatever video format you're you're switching in. Um, the other cool, another a few other cool things it has four multi viewers, and each one of those multi viewers can be configured in several different layouts. So you can do uh, four by four or uh, two program preview up top, and then two or two uh, sections of four inputs down below, kind of the more traditional layout. Um, so anyway, it's pretty cool. I, I, I'm hoping that there, as, as, as Aaron in the chat room there, uh, has said that they'll make a lower input version of this thing and so that it will have something that's a little more affordable. Not everybody needs 40 inputs. Very few people need 40 inputs. Uh, Maybe we'll get something that's half the size with half the number of inputs and half the number of outputs and, and something more affordable. I suspect that will probably happen with time. But I think in this case, they're probably really trying to target a higher-end market than they've worked in before and uh, kind of shoot for the stars a little bit and establish th themselves as an early adopter of, of 8K, even though the 8K capabilities of this thing aren't necessarily that stellar or that amazing. All right, before I go on here, I'm going to go back and answer a couple questions. i got a question from Wendy's here. Uh, Belden 1694A or Quad Shield RG6 for 3 gig SDI permanent install. Uh, it depends on the length. Uh, if you're able, to, if you're doing shorter runs, the Quad Shield RG6 would work fine. If you're doing some longer runs, you might wanna, and when I, when I say longer, like 100 meters, um, 50 to 100 meters thereabouts, I, I'd still definitely step up to 1694. Okay, so let's see. It never ends productions there commenting. I like to look at the new BMD Hyperdeck. I'm going to cover that in a minute. Uh, he's old school, so am I, to some, some degree. All right, and then Satinder commenting that 
He likes the new Satinder and the new constellations routing capabilities. That's very handy. Yes, very much so. That was that was what I that's one of the things I took away from it. Having all those inputs and outputs there on that that switcher is pretty awesome. And one thing they didn't that nobody's really mentioned here, but it also has MADI in and out, so you're able to do tons of channels of audio. Um, I 156 channels of internal mixing I believe it's 128 out and 64 channels in over Maddie if, if I remember right a lot of numbers to remember um, but so you're able to take the, all the basically what they've done is they all the in, different inputs they take the first four audio channels and all the SDI inputs they take the first four audio channels and make those available on the Maddie out so you can then run to external an external mixer and do your audio mixing there and then you can bring up the 64 channels back in so pretty cool stuff. Pretty cool stuff going on there. Okay, so a few more, a few more uh, comments here. Uh, Josh saying they shot for the stars. The constellation, yes. That's probably why they called it that. So that's, that's my guess. They actually, uh, the Grant, when he in, in his technical video, said that they were shooting for the stars with that product. So uh, let's see. Satania visited the, visited the BMX booth and very impressed with its capabilities. We think about a software solution. I'm not a huge fan of software switchers just because of the extra extra latency that they introduce, just by the nature of how they work. Uh, a lot of the situations where I'm where I'm working, I need to have as minimal a delay as possible for going to iMag or projector, and so software solutions are at least always at least one frame behind hardware solutions. So if you're doing a low frame rate, that's that's probably visible. Uh, in Jamar, I don't. I'm, I'm sure I'm going to butcher some of these names. What's the biggest surprise at any? Probably the biggest surprise surprise was how much smaller the show was this year. To be honest, uh, never end saying. I wish they had a 25 USB duplicator versus duplicator for 4K with U with SD cards. Yes, but you can go on to you can go online. You can especially one of the easiest places to find them is eBay to find a, a, a USB duplicators. So and there are recorder devices out there that will record record to USB thumb drives. Okay, let's see, Christian from Holland, are you are you thinking about it? Eight, eight K? Am I gonna upgrade? Um, no. <laughs> um, to be honest, even though I built the trailer out fully four K and my, all my cameras are four K, I have not had a client yet who's asked for four K. In fact, when I've asked, they've always said no because they don't know what to do with all that all that resolution. So, I have not shot video in four K for. I've not switched video in 4K for a client, so that hasn't happened yet. Okay, and then Ken saying he's been using uh, vMix for a couple of years and three camera and uh, portability. It's awesome. Yes, Th there are some there are there are some cool advantages to software based switching. However, for the way I use things, a hardware solution is really about the only way to go. Okay, all right, so. Um, you guys have any questions about the ATEM constellation? I've read a lot of material on this. I have a pretty good idea what this thing is like. Um, just in case you hadn't already heard, the price on this thing is $9,995. Uh, so just under $10,000, um, which I think for what it is, is probably about right. Um, I wish they had a smaller one. Again, not a lot of us don't need... Uh, a lot of us don't need to have 40 inputs or 24 outputs on a switcher, although... That could be nice and allow you to get away with not having a video hub. So, okay. So let's see. David, we're producing in 1080 and stream with six megabit. Don't ever don't see 4K for yourself in a long time. That's true. And then Sheldon asking if I'm going to buy a constellation. No, I I will not be. Uh, the stuff I've got now is more than I need for the type of work that I do. So I mean, moving into the future, if we find that. I have clients that are asking for things that I can't do with the hardware I've got. Maybe I'll consider it, but for right now, I'm pretty happy with what I got. With that said, if Blackmagic wants to send me send me one for free, I wouldn't turn it down. So, all right, moving on to the HyperDeck. Uh, actually, go to the HyperDeck itself here. So this is the HyperDeck Extreme 8K HDR. So it may not be clear, but the HyperDeck Extreme is just this portion over here, and this portion on the right is the control. So these are two separate units. They're sold separately. It's, it, each one is a half rack width wide, so you can put two hyperdecks next to one another, um, which is pretty cool. You can get uh, multiple recorders in 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 the width of one rack space. Uh, it's three rack units high. Uh, it records HD er, HDR 
in up to 8K resolution. It supports resolutions all the way down to standard definition. Uh, touchscreen interface uh, records to CFast cards. Um, let's see. Let's scroll down here a little bit. So, uh, yeah, so quad S 12 gig SDI inputs and outputs. It also has HDMI in and out as well. And it also even has analog for old school standard def. Um, so, what it's pretty clear that, that what one of the things that they were trying to do with this was to give an easier way to migrate old school media, so tapes and whatnot, um, to modern digital files. And so they've designed these products to work really well with some of that old school stuff. In in uh, their Blackmagic's tech demo, that they actually did just that. They took a uh, forty year old tape deck and upconverted the signal and recorded it on a hyperdeck. Uh, so, again, I don't know that 8K is necessarily something that anybody's going to be using in even the next few years. Um, but they're future-proofing. The way that all this stuff is based on electronics, it's really not hard for them to go to 8K. And I th Again, I think the main reasons to buy this product are, have nothing to do with the 8K. It's more about the, everything else that it brings to the table. You know, a nice big screen, recording to see fast, having having some uh, features in there to prevent data loss when uh, you're using media that's not quite as fast as it should be, or media when media fills up. Like, uh, one of the things that they mentioned briefly in their intro is that the, this can be fitted with an SSD uh, on the on the underside of the unit. Uh, PCI Express based SSD and that will basically be used as a cache in order to make sure that you don't lose any data, you don't drop any data. So if your recording media is not fast enough to keep up with your recording, it goes to the cache on the SSD and then is written to the, your, your media as, as, as it can, as it becomes available. So and they talked about how they were able to record, I believe they said 8K, yeah, 8K video onto a mechanical hard drive over USB because they had the cache in there to to take uh, the uh, extra load, that e extra data that couldn't be written to the data in real time. So some pretty cool things there. As mentioned, a couple people mentioned in the, in the chat room here, um, is it has USB-C on the back as well, so you can plug in an external hard drive, or you can use their brand new multi-dock drives with it as well. Um, it's designed. The new multi-dock has two separate USB inputs, so you can have uh, with four drives across, you put those above two hyperdecks, and each each hyper hyperdeck has two SSDs that you can you can talk to that way. So, pretty cool stuff going on there. Um, let's see what else. The other thing that was ver was pretty cool here is this act actual controller. So, um, step over go over to this other page here and we'll talk about the controller. So. They didn't. They didn't really emphasize this in any of the materials that I saw. But this unit actually controls eight separate decks, and yeah, there we go. So, so you have eight decks, and then you can you can set it, set the control to control one for playback purposes and one for record purposes. So basically, for editing or for duplicating, uh, you can control two decks. You switch between a record deck and a play play deck pretty quickly. So let me see there's a pic where there's a picture of it. Okay, yeah, right here. So there's a button to say I'm going to record the play deck, and then there's another one to say I'm going to record the re control the recording deck. Um, it has really nice. I got to feel this. Th this knob here is really really nice and great tactile feedback. You're able to use that for shuttle jogging, and then this one pos uh, the position control is actually pretty. Pretty neat because so basically when you hit that, you're able to go through the any any portion of the video from start to finish. So from a zero percent at the beginning to 100 percent at the end, and be able to jump around very quickly. I hadn't seen that done anywhere before. That's pretty cool. Um, let's see what else. Um, so the other cool thing about this thing is it just it, it actually just uses standard RS422 for recording or for control, and so. It works with not just the new Hyperdex, but it works with any of those old legacy decks. Like I said, in the, in the tech demo that they released, they were controlling a, a, a tape deck from 1980 with, with this unit, since it just uses RS-422. And because you can control eight decks with it, you're able to uh, very quickly switch between 
an old tape deck and a modern hyper deck. Pretty cool thing going on there. Okay, so questions. Um, so David Vilter asking if there's any news on recording four independent 1080 channels on one hyper deck over the four SD inputs. Right now, I don't believe it does that. Um, they, they've made no mention of that in any of the materials that I've looked at, so I'm, I'm going to say the answer is probably no. Uh, there, there was a product that I saw and from AJA that does that. I'll cover that here in a few minutes. All right, uh, and then Matt asking if, the, if if I think the really similar devices lower lower specs or lower prices. Who knows? Um, in a lot of ways, they already have pro products that are kind of like that. You know, they have they have their HyperDeck Studio series, the One U rack units, and they also have the HyperDeck Studio Mini, um, which you know, a third of a rack space. So you know, they've got recorders that kind of cover a lot of that need. So I'm guessing probably not. Um, let's see. And then, let's see, Doug, it never ends. One deck can only record one source, right? That's correct, yeah. So each deck only record, records one video source. Uh, so it's pretty clear that they were going for a high-end product here. And it, 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 part of the feeling that I get from from their materi materials that they've released in the last little while is that they're really trying to aim for a slightly high end, higher end customer than they've been working with in the past. And they're trying to really work their way into the higher end broadcast industry. Uh, you know, people that are bigger than what I do, right? So, you know, your television studios and broadcast networks and whatnot. And they're really trying to make themselves more relevant in those markets where they've, they've traditionally been frowned upon a little bit. Uh, so I think they're they're trying to at this point trying to make the, some of their moves and, and move upscale a little bit and the hyperdeck and the new constellation are definitely uh, definitely uh, right in line with that. So uh, so Tinder asking who this deck is meant for again it's you know they advertise it as 8K nobody's really doing 8K and I don't see 8K really becoming a thing. You know, even the jump from HD to 4K for the consumer, no perceivable improvement in quality. And the, the main reason to shoot even 4K is so that you have your options for cropping in in post. So 8K gives you more, but, you know, a lot of us don't need that. And I don't see 8K becoming a thing for the consumer at all. So, um, let's see. I guess we're going to move on to the next thing. Bottom line is the HyperDeck uh, definitely meant as... HyperDeck Extreme is definitely meant as a higher-end product for broadcast-type customers. All right, so the next one. So this is the SDI to HDMI 8K converter. So this takes quad SDI in and converts it to HDMI. It does quite a bit more than that, though. So I didn't do a video on this one. Um... Not sure why, I just didn't. But uh, cool product here. Um, it does some stuff besides just the conversion. So it does. It has built-in scopes, so you can do things like uh, vector uh, vector scope, waveform monitor, uh, overlay on on screen. It does support HDR and recognize the different HDR formats. Uh, it does do 3D LUTs. So uh, it also has monitor calibration built in. So using uh, these sensors from various different manufacturers, uh, they support quite a few of the standard ones. You can actually do a monitor calibration, then it builds a what, which you can actually download out of the unit if you want to. Um, it also does down conversion for whatever type of monitor you have to happen to plug in. We've seen that from a number of other Blackmagic converters in the past, so if you ha do happen to have an 8K signal going in and you plug it into a high-def tele television, just a you know, regular HD, uh, it will down convert for you 4K, obviously. Um, as unlike the traditional HyperDeck, or sorry, unlike the traditional TerraDeck, TerraDeck Mini, uh, it has this monitor, a little monitor for controlling it, and buttons on the front, out of the box instead of having to be added on later. Two units fit in one rack space, so instead of being uh, one third like their Terranex, other Terranex Mini products have been, it occupies a half a rack space. Um, again, it's it's a converter, so you know nothing to get too incredibly excited about, but it does give a way to get 8K 
like there aren't really any broadcast 8k monitors yet so at this point if you want to monitor 8k you're picking up most likely you're picking up a consumer television and uh so that's what the, that's what this is for so you can take your sdi 8k sdi signals and be able to view them in full resolution or at least be able to display them on a 4k or hd monitor as well so um yeah, and it's a converter. So uh, the pricing on that one was twelve ninety five. Uh, so considerably more expensive than their other converters, but considering it does eight K, that makes sense. And it also has one other feature that, that was mentioned in the tech video that they haven't they haven't mentioned anywhere else, where you can do quad display out. So if you had an eight K signal coming in, you could split that up and divide it across four displays, um, eight or four four K displays, and get full re resolution that way. Um, digital signage for that that, you know, that you can, is a popular application for that so uh, let's see so any questions guys about any of the other black magic products because I'm going to move on uh, to something else here nothing else nothing no, but nothing coming in here okay. all right so I'm gonna move on so AJA so they introduced this new key pro go this is a multi-channel uh, video recorder uh, uses H.264. It records to USB media, so USB flash drives. Uh, you can record four channels simultaneously. It does high definition and standard definition. So this was probably the product that was most exciting from AJA. I didn't cover anything else in my uh, YouTube coverage. Uh, so yeah, so this is a, this is an interesting product. Um, I'm not 100% exactly sure who they're trying to target here because mainly because their recording format is just H.264. So you're not going to get any of your high resolution, uh, high level of detail formats like ProRes or uh, DNX HD out of this. But uh, it, the unit is just a half unit, half, half rack unit, half rack wide, <laughs> two rack units high. And so you can do two of them side by side and get eight channels of recording in two rack spaces. Uh, it does do playback, but only one from one source at a time. So, um, so and this is Tinder asking how it will handle crappy flash drives that probably can't support the speeds, probably drop frames. So, anyway, um, yeah, in interesting product from from AJA. Uh, they've they've had some interesting video products in the past, uh, recorders and whatnot. Um, I'm kind of interested in in their encoder the helo series i didn't get a chance to play with that but uh this was the, by far the product that most people there at the aja booth were excited about so um yeah and then yeah weston james saying the key pro go is very tempting for people who need to deliver multiple places quickly and then never ends doug there saying that he owns the key pro ultra plus so I, the people that have them seem to really like them um i think they're i think they are good products um and then, yeah, Weston Jones mentioned that the KeyPro rep said that any USB, 3.1 USB flash driver SSD will work. That's, that is true. So you can plug in, there's a USB port on the back, and you can plug in, you can either make that a primary uh, recording location, or you can make it a backup pro recording location. Each uh, media slot, you can configure with different levels of encoding. So you can do low quality, medium quality, high quality, uh, all H.264, of course. Um, so... Yeah, and, and uh, so anyway, that's named at a different, different market than some of the other recorders that, like Blackmagic offers, for example, which are designed around SD cards. So different workflow, uh, different, uh, different intended target market there. Okay, all right, move on to the Decimator 12G Cross. This is one of those, one of the things that I was most excited about after attending the show. Uh, if you guys have seen this channel very much, you know that I absolutely love the Decimator MDHX, which is just a universal convert anything to anything else unit. Um, absolutely indispensable. I use that I use those for everything. I've got four of them, and I use I use them constantly. They're awesome for making sure that you're getting the video formats that you that you want. Uh, cross, classic application for me. I'm doing a a video where I've got a presenter with a laptop as a PowerPoint or a keynote, something like that, and they, we, I need to incorporate that into my, into my streaming. Well, 
I can, can't never guarantee that the laptop they're plugging in gives you the video format you want, so you plug their laptop into a decimator and do the conversion. And until this year, they have not had any 4K products. Decimator has not had a single 4K product, and they just barely announced this. Uh, so it does conversion between HDMI and SDI, both directions, even simultaneously. So any combination of video coming in on any input can go to any other output. So it's pretty flexible routing. Um, this one also adds gen lock, so you can make sure that your output is locked to um, everything else in your video, video, video setup. Um, let's see, it has a higher quality scaler than their other products they've had in the past. So pretty cool feature there. Um, now the rep that I talked to misled me a little bit. Uh, one of the things they had on display there was one of these hooked up to basically a unit that does a bunch of scopes. And I asked the rep if the unit itself had the scopes built in and he told me it does. However, I found out later that's not actually the case. So if you watch my video, the information I posted there is wrong. Uh, I've since done an update in the description in the comments as well. But again, the product is still awesome. So for $495, you can convert any format from standard definition up to 4K to any other format from standard edition definition up to 4K. Any any combination of frame rates, um, as long as they're video, they're stand, video standard frame rates. So you're not going to get like... 1024 by 768 from a computer to work. It has to be a video uh, resolution and format, but awesome to have. Converts anything to anything else. R super low power. This thing only consumes 6 watts, so it barely even gets warm. Even though I wasn't allowed to play with the menu, they did allow me to put my hand on it to feel how, how cool it was to the touch. Uh, so, again, this is going to be one of those products that if you're doing any sort of work in 4K, just buy it. You know you're gonna you're gonna thank me for it. That's awesome. Um, so yeah, so the the uh, new 12G Cross from Decimator. They weren't they didn't out announce any other products there. Uh, just the one, but this one is pretty exciting. It probably means that there are other 4K products in the works and probably be coming before too long. Okay, so let's look at comments. Um, let's see, so Tinder literally just bought the MDHX right before the show. Uh, worth returning and buying is uh, if you don't need 4K, no, there's n absolutely no reason to to get this one instead because it's essentially the same thing. The only the only feature this one offers uh, that you don't have if you're not doing 4K is the GenLock input. Okay, let's see. And then next one, Ian asking asking about uh, scopes. Yeah, that doesn't have scopes. Again, that rep uh, gave me some bad information. Weston. You now monitor A7S2 and 4K and send SDI to an SDI monitor for talent. Yes, you absolutely could do that. So, uh, pretty cool. Uh, Ian, else, any, anything about updates for the 4ME for scaling on inputs and Fairlight Mixer for running outputs? How about a 12G Universal Video Hub with, with fiber? Nothing about any one of those things. Um, so, um, and I have no inside, inside information either. So. Okay, moving on. So the next thing I wanted to mention is something I can't actually find on the internet. I cannot on the on the on the web, other than a short YouTube video which mentions it. And that's this is the these are this is the RCP product from Scarhoy. I got to ta talk to Casper, Casper for quite a while. Nice, super nice guy. And. Uh, and those of us who use Sony camcorders, or Sony or Canon camcorders, in some, in some cases Panasonic, we don't have any way to remotely control the exposure, white balance, and so forth like you would when you're dealing with real broadcast cameras that have a, a dedicated CCU, you know, the full chain. Um, so uh, we're stuck with having to give up instructions to camera operators on how to adjust the exposure. So... Uh, you know, if the exposure is too dark, we have to tell the cam camera operator over the intercom, hey, you know, boost your gain or open your iris or whatever. Uh, they have come up with a way, a w way of controlling Sony, Canon, and and Panasonic camcorders that don't tr have traditional CCU controls uh, in that way. So basically, emulating a CCU, and it's done through this panel and then there's a little converter uses ethernet and then has in the case of the sony and canon it has 
uh, a LANC, L-A-N-C uh, output on it. And so you plug that in. And you're uh, th then able to control shading and exposure on your cameras. So this is pretty awesome. I, I wish that there was more coverage of these. Uh, because this is something that a lot of us have been waiting for for a long time. So I'm going to try and get some of these in for testing. Uh, Casper seemed agreeable to helping out with that. Uh, and we'll see how it goes. So pretty awesome. Um, the Technically, the control panel itself isn't necessarily re required for that. Uh, just need some software to, in order to send the commands to their little adapter box. Um, so hopefully, at some point... Uh, somebody else or maybe me will produce some software uh, in order to send those commands in order to control cameras remotely because that's been uh, a real problem for me like I did a, a show last 4th of July it was a it was a big deal the people I was working with insisted on providing their own camera operators instead of me hiring them for budget reason reasons and the guys they hired were awful they they didn't know anything about how to control a camera and so throughout most of the show the cameras were overexposed the white balance was wrong it was an outdoor event in the morning so the white balance kept needed to, needed to be changed constantly and no matter how hard I tried I could not get those guys to figure out how to control those cameras so if I had something like this I would have been able to avoid that problem and would uh but it would have been able to have proper exposure and proper white balance and have a video that I could actually have been proud of instead of something that I was kind of ashamed to pe show people so um, so we'll move on to some questions about this. Um, okay, so Casper is very kind. Great solid products that have come a long way since since started following. Yes, uh, so Scarhoy is a company that has produced a lot of cool products for a long time. Traditionally, they've been really, really expensive. And they, and he and I have communicated in email quite a few, quite a bit in the past about introducing some lower lower cost products. And I'm sure he didn't do it because because I said so. But they have been doing a better job about introducing budget friendly products. Um, so anyway, and then let's see, Christopher asking about scopes on the converter. There are no scopes on that converter. So, and then Weston asking if these RCPs work with the Sony EX3. They do not. Sony EX3 has a very unique, um, very unique. A connector on it for for zoom control and camera control and so yeah these will not work it, this this require would require the LAN C connection or LANC connection uh, available on most of the Sony camera recorders that are kind of in the lower end of the range from I don't think the, a lot of those controls work on the consumer ones but you know cameras like the Z150 the Z190 uh, the Z9 the Z90 um, those those all work and he had a he had a, a Z90 there that he, he was controlling, uh, and it worked pretty well. It's it's you don't get all the same flexibility that you get with a proper camera chain, but it's much better than nothing, much much better than nothing. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna figure out a way to incorporate this into my workflow, uh, so I can avoid nightmares like I experienced last summer. So, any other questions about anything I've talked about so far? Okay. Um, Let's see. That's actually all that I had specifically lined up to talk about. Uh, I'm happy to take any other general questions about NAB or any of the products that I looked at. Um, again, if you've never been, I would encourage you to go if you can. Uh, not necessarily for the opportunity to look at new products, but to interact with the people who are creating those products and and uh, and be able to talk to them, and you're able to get a better feel for what they were thinking. You're able to get in feature requests in a way that you would never be able to get in otherwise. And also, you can establish relationships with people um, you wouldn't be able to otherwise. Uh, you know, one of my traveling partners, uh, Dave, um, he's been able to make some amazing connections with people who work on some of the biggest films in the industry uh, and be able to talk to them one-on-one -on -one for hours at a time um, to get advice on how to improve his own work. And so uh, a lot of it's just really cool to be able to interact with a lot of the people who are working in the industry that you probably wouldn't be able to talk to otherwise. You know, they're kind of kept behind the scenes and they're they're not exp they're, they're not given visible exposure through the normal channels. So all right, so so Tinder asking if I went to any seminars. No, I did not. Um, 
that but that is a good reason another good reason to go to nab they you know they do have a, a lot of a lot of manufacturers have seminars nab itself puts on some as well a lot of a lot of cool things going on there um let's see any Atomos product releases uh, release opinions from weston i didn't spend any time at the Atomos booth and i didn't see on their website what they announced so yeah i don't have anything to talk about there I've seen the Bird Dog 4K Quad, and it's about NDI. Uh, if you watch this channel, you know I'm not a big fan of NDI, uh, mostly because it's not integrated into the type of switchers that I that work for me. You know, I need hardware switchers for the type of work that I do, and so far none of those support that. And trying to adapt NDI into an SDI workflow is just cost prohibitive and offers basically no advantage over just doing straight SDI. So I don't use NDI. And and I, I do keep an eye on what's going on over there, but so far I've seen no compelling reason to incorporate that. Okay, so Eric asking if you have your LAN, LANC connector or LANC connector meant for zoom and focus control, would you be able to, put, to combine that with a scar hoy? Uh, yes, there. I'll show you it handy, but but there's a little box you can get that allows you to combine uh, data input from two LANC devices for a single camera. So it is possible. It will cost a little bit of money to do it, but it is technically possible. Um, maybe we can talk Casper into producing another product that has Ethernet in, link out, and has a Zoom controller built in. That'd be pretty cool. So, all right. Um, other than that, uh, I don't have much else to report on. I, again, it was awesome being there. Um, Oh, and then, okay, and then we got uh, Doug at Never Ends asking what I think about VizRT requiring new tech. Don't really have a strong opinion about it. Um, but the, both of those are companies that I have never really haven't really done any work with. I don't have strong opinions about either one, and I don't have an opinion about acquisition either. So, uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, being there was awesome. Uh, went with a couple great people, Dave and Witt, and uh, both... Excited to be there. It's fun to fun to have them both of them along. It, it is a lot more fun to go to NAB with other people than it is to try and go by yourself. Um, so if you're going to go, bring bring a companion along, uh, even if they aren't necessarily into that. There are there are things that people can enjoy. So yes, and then Dave and then Dave and Scows and Films and mounts that the Scar Hoy has four way buttons. He was really excited about that. Uh, the Scar the Scar Hoy controllers. I don't think on this unit, but a lot of the units, these buttons actually are five buttons in one. So you can do up, down, left, right, and then straight down on the button. So you can get a lot more control than you do on traditional buttons. So anyway, uh, if you guys don't have any other questions or comments, um, I'm going to kind of wrap this up. I do have more content coming for the channel. Uh, I mean, after I finish this, I'm, I'll be recording another video that I hope to release in the next day or two. Um, so anyway. Thanks, everyone, for watching. And if you have not yet checked out my software, my website for doing management of your video production business, please do so. That website is crewaxis.com, C-R-E-W-A-X-I-S.com. And I will be posting a link in the description for this video where you can get a discount on, on that site. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, and we have plans for all the way from free all the way up to enterprise and features basically for every size of business. So thanks everyone for watching and have a fantastic day.